Hey, good morning, friends. It's 4.33 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's December 14th, um, 2016, according to the Gregorian calendar. And uh, before I forget about it, um, tomorrow, I believe it's tomorrow, is going to be the presentation, I believe the final presentation, the coup de grace, perhaps, of Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County, Arizona, concerning the bogus birth certificate of the current president in office, Barack Hussein Obama, if that's even his real name. I think that based on, if, uh, if, if none of you have seen the presentation that he has made so far, he had, uh, assigned a detective to do this. And, uh, and you can get the details of this by watching the presentation that they made four years ago. Um, now why it's taken this amount of time, I don't know. And I don't know why it's being timed in the way it's being timed. December 15th of 2016. You know, um, I know that also four years ago in December is when they put together the Sandy Hook hoax. And what they're up to it's, it's so hard to say. I don't know anybody who can really figure it out what they're playing at. It's, it's beyond me. When you see what's happening in, in the mainstream media, how so many of them are being proven as liars, people that that spread disinformation. It's being proven that these media outlets, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, are simply owned by private interests and as, as one um, social media news vlogger said that uh, these media outlets essentially serve as the blog for private interests. They, they don't care about uh, turning a profit, and they don't really need to. It is one of the greatest propaganda machines the world has ever known. And that would lead us again back to Revelation 13 and the second beast. He deceives all the people on the earth. It's amazing. It is so amazing the layers and the depths of deception that exist in this world today and where it's coming from. When you read Revelation 13 and you understand who those beasts are, you look around and you see everything that's happening and you think, yeah, I, it's no wonder. So, um, yeah, who knows if there's a, uh, a certain ulterior motive that is bigger and broader than this um, Sheriff Arpaio wanting to reveal the truth. And now, if, <clears throat> if Sheriff Arpaio, if he is a man who is truly um, a, a truthful man who has integrity, and he does believe in the rule of law 
and he believes that he is a servant of that law to keep and maintain law and order and to protect and serve the people of his county and ultimately his country then what he is doing is a good thing if he's not and he's been compromised and he's working with those who wish to subvert our law and overthrow us through massive um, introduction and maintaining of an immoral culture. If he's in with them, then this is part of an ongoing deception, and they are just going to use this and the revelations of the um, compromised media across the board, mainstream media, and the revelations of the corrupt alphabet agencies of this country and the, the revelations of the um, illegitimate, uh, illegitimacy of uh, the current sitting president. They're going to try to use all of that against the people of this nation as they have been using the immorality that they have been spreading all over this nation to subjugate us because that is a um, a very proven way to subjugate a nation uh, especially a nation who at one time uh, much of the nation had a great faith in the God of the Bible and exercised uh, a great deal of morality in desiring to do his will if they break that down and they break down the close relationship that we have with this all-powerful holy god then they can subjugate us and this is something they need to do because lately i've been looking into what we are to do as christians how we are to behave, how we are to conduct ourselves. Because there seems to be a great deal of confusion. Most pastors out there, whether they be the local church pastor, whether they be a, a big TV pastor or anything else, they don't really teach on Romans 13. They may reference it from time to time when they're trying to convince everybody that they should just keep their heads down and, and take whatever kind of garbage, immoral, uh, stuff that that evil men in power uh force upon us but i'm not so sure that that is the way i've read romans 13 again and again i've i've read what the apostles have done at different times when it comes down to being a, a choice between serving god and obeying man i understand that Romans 13 says that let all men, not just those who are Christians or in the church, but it says let all men be subject to these authorities. Let all men, let's not have anarchy. I can't really have any fellowship with an anarchist. Uh, I could have a dialogue with them in so much as I would just be trying to convince them of the errors of anarchy. Uh, the Bible tells us, let all men be subject to these authorities. But if the authorities in one's country are illegitimate, if they are outside forces sent to supplant a people and to subjugate a people, if they have no right to be there and to do what they are doing, then what is our responsibility? I think that Oliver Cromwell would have had and did have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I think he did have a great deal to say about that because the king at the time that Oliver Cromwell 
uh, did take on the responsibility of being England's um, Lord Protector for a time. He knew that the Catholic Church was simply just setting up kings as their agents, their puppets. The king that was sitting in England, if they were a subject of the Catholic Church, they were an illegitimate king because they were not a king of that people. They were simply a representative of a foreign government. So for that reason, he took on the mantle of, of um, protector of England for some time and then gave it up. He did not hold on to it any longer than it needed to be held on to. And Oliver Cromwell was a Puritan. The Puritans are the people who greatly populated this country, uh, the United States, in its infancy. Many Puritans fled England because of the uh, the oft oppressive nature of even the Anglican Church. They often would uh, f flee England and other parts of Europe because of the great evil and oppression of the Catholic Church. Many people that populated this country in the early days were fleeing the persecution from the Catholic Church in and around Europe. And it makes you think of Revelation 12, where it says that the dragon spewed out a flood of water uh, from his mouth after the woman. and But the earth helped the woman, and it swallowed up this flood of water. So the dragon was angry and wrathful at the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and had the faith of Jesus. Now it says that the earth helped those people that he sent a flood after. And we can see from Daniel 9, a flood is armies. That flood he spewed forth from his mouth would be armies that he would send after the woman. The woman, we know, is the church. So the dragon who gives the beast his power, he sent forth all of these armies against the woman, the real remnant church that existed uh, all around the known world at the time where Rome had its tentacles and its power at, and it sent armies after this woman and persecuted and murdered this woman, and the earth helped this woman and swallowed up that flood of armies to where they couldn't hurt the woman anymore. And then in the next chapter in Revelation 13, what does it tell us? In Revelation 13, starting in verse 11, I believe, he says, I saw a beast come up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb, but it spoke as a dragon. Now, I've looked in a lot of the, uh, the documents of uh, our founding fathers, and uh, I guess a lot of people can make whatever they want out of these things, and uh, I guess if you're sentimental, you can believe a lot of things that you want to believe about most of the founding fathers of this country. But when I read the documents uh, that they left for us, the letters that they have written and the statements that they have made, uh, I don't see, I, I don't hear, typically, men who <clears throat> keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm not seeing. That's what I'm not hearing in them. This land may have been populated with truly faithful Christians, but from its start, the, the people who said that they represented us and spoke for us, they speak like dragons and have sense. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens tomorrow with Joe Arpaio. I think they're gonna they're gonna broadcast their findings live. I'll try to find a link of that uh, first talk that they did and what they presented. I guess very telling. Now I'm sorry. Getting back to um, I'm sorry. Getting back to Romans 13 and what I was saying about. 
the Bible being clear that, that we should sub subject ourselves to the authorities. Because it, it says this, it says the authorities, the authorities that it, it exist, and the governments that exist, that they were ordained by, that they were put there by God, so that they would be a terror to evil. Now, when you look at uh, the country we live in, the United States of America, and who's running it and what they are doing with it, I'm not convinced at this point in time that that's actually our government. You know, I scratched my head a little bit and I thought about it because I want to do. I want to do what the Bible tells me to do. And it doesn't matter to me what, what that means. I mean, if, if the Bible tells me to, to keep my head down in subservience and do everything that those people who are placed over me societally or, or, or anything else tell me, then that's what I'm going to do because I want to do the will of God and I want to be obedient to Him. The thing is, the Bible tells us that all governments and authorities were ordained by and placed by God. In this country, if you ask anyone who is knowledgeable on this country and the laws of this country and you ask them what is the chief law of the land in this country they should respond to you immediately with not the president not congress not the supreme court the constitution the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of this land. Now, if we believe Romans 13, and I believe Romans 13, all governments are established by God. And uh, I'll, I'll just go to Romans uh, 13 real fast, because the last thing I want to do is to misquote it but let's see it very clearly from Romans 13 and what the word has to say let every soul be in subjection to the higher authorities for there is no authority except from God and those who exist are ordained by God therefore he who resists the authority withstands the ordinance of God, and those who withstand will receive to themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil. Do you desire to have no fear of the authority? Do that which is good, and you will have praise from the same, for he is a servant of God to you for good." But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he doesn't bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger for wrath to him who does evil. Therefore, you need to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For this reason you also pay taxes, for they are servants of God's service, attending continually on this very thing. Give therefore to everyone what you owe. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, respect to whom respect, honor to whom honor. So, <clears throat> this right here in no way is telling us that we need to obey evil laws from evil men. It is not saying that. It says in verse 4, for he is a servant of God to you for good. Now just consider the Sanhedrin that Peter and John went before when they commanded them to not preach the name of Jesus. And they responded to them. It is better for us to obey God than man. And if you think there's something wrong with a Christian standing firm on the law of the land and using that 
against the authorities themselves so that they will obey the good law of the land. Then consider, <clears throat> when Paul was taken in, um, well, I think it was Caesarea, he was taken by the, uh, the Roman authorities when he was trying to speak to the Jews and they were causing this big tumult and everything. He was taken there and the man was going to have him flogged. And Paul says to him, is it lawful for you to flog a Roman citizen and one who has not even been tried? And I could imagine the guy going ghost white, not even realizing that Paul was a citizen of Rome and what he was about to do and the consequences that could possibly have come down on his head because that was a law of Rome. And Paul used that law of Rome because Paul didn't feel like being flogged. Do you? Do you feel like continually being flogged? When the men who are doing these things are not even following the law of the land? And we see in Romans 13, when laws are evil or go against God's laws, no matter who proclaims them, you don't have to follow them. Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you have to follow any wicked law that goes against God's law, ask them. Why was John on the Isle of Patmos? Was he on the Isle of Patmos for obeying the laws of the land? It's said by many that John was exiled to Patmos during one of the harsh um, persecutions of the church by Rome <clears throat> in Asia Minor. Um, and this, this was during the time of, um, oh, I will find it real fast, the Roman Emperor. Okay, I'm sorry guys, I had to pause it so I could um, punch this in and look it up. Because, <clears throat> of course, uh, the name kept going through my head, Diocletian. No, it wasn't Diocletian. Diocletian was the uh, 4th century Domitian. It was the Roman Emperor Domitian, which would have been right at the... should have been... Domitian should have been right... Was that right at the end of the Julian, or was he one of the first in the Order of the Flavians? Not sure that matters, okay, because I'm getting off topic. Domitian. He was exiled under Roman Emperor Domitian for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for preaching the word of God, for the testimony of Christ, the word of God. He was exiled for because I'm sure that what he was doing was contrary to the laws of Rome. So there are certain times when any empire decrees laws that are against the laws of God that those who serve God have to do his will and please him and not that wicked government. That can get difficult. Ask those who came through the Great Tribulation who were slaughtered all day long by Rome and the Roman Empire, those nations of Europe who bowed to the Pope of Rome. So that's the thing. What's the law of the land here? What's the Constitution? It's the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And it seems to me, I'm not the smartest guy, I don't know everything about law or constitutional law, but it seems to me like, uh, like these slick wolves up there in Washington, D.C., have been trampling all over the document that we came to believe was the law of the land. Now, if they're lying to us, and they're telling us that's the law of the land, and that really isn't the law of the land, 
and shame on them. That tells me that they probably don't have any authority over us. If they're telling us the law of the land is the Constitution, and everybody can agree across the board the law of the land is the Constitution, then the law of the land is the Constitution. There's nothing I've found in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that goes against <clears throat> that goes against God's law. And I've just started I've just started looking into it and studying it, so I'm I'm sorry, but I am ignorant to a degree. There's many of you out there that, that are far more knowledgeable on these things than me. But I haven't found anything in those documents that go against the laws of God. In fact, I've found things in those documents that try to guarantee that you and I can express our faith without fear of being hunted down in this land like we once were by the papacy in Europe for over a millennia. You know, so, so should Christians just cower and do whatever evil men say? <clears throat> oh, I'm not so sure. It seems to me that it's good for us to uphold and obey the law of the land as long as it's not an evil law that, that specifically goes against God's law, and the law of our land is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I think we should all, I think we would all do a great service to our God and Creator, who has established all authorities and all, all governments, and we would do a great service to one another and our countrymen if we, the Church, look more into this get ourselves more well educated on it so that we can be the light and we can be the leaders because those who are leading right now are the darkness they are the darkness they worship the dragon because the dragon gives the beast his power this is why you have so many disgusting satanists in places of power the Bible told us they worship the dragon. Why? Because they know that the dragon gives his power to the beast. They see what great power that that beast has. So they worship the dragon because they want the dragon to give them power. That's why they do it. Those are many of the men who are running around in charge. They, they have no thought whatsoever for the laws of God, nor the laws of this country, the Constitution. Now, if, if, during the time of the Civil War, if Rome did the same thing in this country that they did over in England by establishing the city around the time of Henry, Henry II, then what they have done is deceitful in the extreme. That means we were all born and raised under deceit. We've all been lied to. None of us agreed to be chattel or a cog in some kind of a corporate system that we don't want to have anything to do with. We all came into this world, those of us who were in the United States, believing that we came into this world as citizens of the United States of America under the laws of the Constitution of this country, not as some commodity for some illegal corporation that was underhandedly set up and perpetuated over in the District of Columbia by the same beast that did it in the City of London hundreds of years before. That's not what any of us agreed to. We did not agree to all of the legalities that they secretly and deceptively control us all with, that they use to continue to rob us. 
And if we are to obey the laws of this land, then every single one of us need to consider whether it is good and right and moral to pay an income tax which was never lawfully ratified by the states. And there's plenty of documentation out there to prove that as well. So what am I doing? Am I sitting here all of a sudden encouraging everyone, revolt, revolt? No, not at all. I'm encouraging everyone to do as the Bible said. Let us obey the laws of this land because they were established by God. Now, if God showed enough great kindness on this world to establish a country as strong as the United States of America under a document as freeing and powerful as the Constitution and Bill of Rights, we must Consider the implications of that. Consider that a great blessing and gift from God. And do all we can to educate ourselves on the laws of this land and the authority of that document so that we can be good servants of God and obey the laws of our land. Okay, so now that I got that rant out of the way, <clears throat> let me go to, uh, and that that's something that I'm I'm just currently working on, and I'm I'm looking into because I know there's a lot of people out there that have been scratching their head for a long time, and and have been wondering, you know, what does this mean to me that I should, you know, obey these laws because I've had all of these uh, all these leaders tell me that you know I'm just supposed to blindly uh, obey whatever law that is passed no matter how wicked how evil how unconstitutional how against the Bill of Rights there's probably plenty of there's probably plenty of, of spiritual leaders out there who would tell us um, that there's something wrong with somebody like Joe Arpaio looking into the legitimacy of the Obama presidency by picking apart this birth certificate. And I would tell them they are wrong because he should be abiding by the laws of the United States of America's Constitution and Bill of Rights. He, above everyone, is subject to those laws. Not above them. Subject to them. Okay. I better digress, or I'll just keep going with this. But I will return to this later, I promise, because this is not over for me. You know, um, I believe that there are good, clear answers as well as, as clear answers concerning um, <clears throat> self-defense, you know, and, and what is the, the biblical point of view, our Lord Jesus Christ's point of view of defending not only ourselves, but those who we have been charged with defending and protecting. I will get to those things uh, later on as well. But... Now, before the time gets too far away from me, let me go into page 3 of hushmoney.org, which is the 501c3 myths page. Okay, here we go with the myths. 501c3 myths. 1. A church or church ministry must be 501c3 in order to avoid paying taxes. 2. A church or church ministry must be a 501c3 in order to be tax deductible. 3. Churches should comply with all the laws of the land because Jesus said, in quote, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, uh, which would be Mark 12, 17. Therefore, it is only right for a church to become a 501c3. 
MYTH4, being a 501c3, helps to legitimize a church in the eyes of the world. After all, Paul said, quote, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. 2 Corinthians 8.21 Myths 1 and 2 have been promulgated for years by swarms of attorneys, <clears throat> as well as some accountants. Both myths are patently false. When it comes to legal and tax matters, most people just assume that the licensed professionals, in quotes, know what they're talking about. Little do people realize that far too many attorneys never personally study the law for themselves and are merely parroting what they've heard other attorneys say. Once a myth gets started in the legal profession, it tends to spread like a wildfire, particularly when the myth can make a lot of money for tens of thousands of attorneys who want to take advantage of it. We'll debunk these myths using the IRS's own publications. Myth number three is often promulgated by folks who misconstrue the statements of Jesus to justify placing his church under state authority theologically. This is referred to as Erastianism, a position that holds that the church is and ought to be subordinate to the state. Myth four is often promulgated by those who are preoccupied with pleasing men in order to win their approval. This is problematic because it inevitably results in worldly compromise. The emphasis in Paul's teaching is first upon doing what is honest, quote, in the sight of the Lord, unquote. Only then we are enabled to do what is honest, quote, in the sight of men. Unquote. <clears throat> Myth 1. Tax Exempt The IRS has acknowledged for decades that it is completely unnecessary for any church to apply for a tax-exempt status. According to IRS Publication 557 as well as IRS Code 508, churches and church ministries are exempt automatically. Application for an exempt status is not only superfluous, but to do so subordinates that church to the IRS. Churches in America have always been non-taxable anyway. It simply makes no sense for a church to go to the IRS and seek permission to be exempted from a tax the government can't impose in the first place. The church in America is protected from the government by the First Amendment. We just talked about that. It's a law of the land. The Constitution kept the church free to begin with. <laughs> Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Unquote. It would be absurd to suppose that you could have free exercise of religion if you had to pay for it. Taxes. If Congress can make no law respecting the church, it can make no law to tax the church. The IRS lacks the jurisdiction necessary to tax the churches in America. The IRS has no more jurisdiction over the churches in America than it does over the churches in Canada. It would be as absurd and tyrannical for the IRS to tax the churches in America as it would be for the IRS to tax the churches in Canada. They don't have the jurisdiction. Myth 2. Tax Deductible Whether or not a church or church ministry applies for and receives a 501c3 tax-exempt recognition letter from the IRS, any contributions made to a church are automatically qualified as a tax write-off to the contributor pursuant to the IRS Publication 526 and IRS Code 170C2B. A church does not have to be a, quote, non-profit charitable organization, unquote, to be tax deductible, nor does it need IRS authorization to be tax deductible. 
according to the IRS, churches have that status automatically. <clears throat> and I want to bring in my own comment right here, folks, is uh, you, did Jesus or did Jesus not say to us, do not let your right hand know what your left hand does? That if, if you do your charity giving before men, then you are given a man's reward. But if you do it secretly, you will be rewarded by your heavenly Father in the open. So why would we care if an institution was tax deductible or not? That is seeking a reward from men, and you will get no reward from God if that's what you're doing. So on to myth number three, render to Caesar. Jesus did indeed say, quote, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unquote. But that's only half the verse. Jesus went on to say, quote, and to God the things that are God's, unquote. The obvious question to be asked is, at what time did Jesus place his church under the authority and jurisdiction of Caesar or the state? Mark 12, 17 is the most brilliant teaching on lawful authority and legal jurisdiction that anyone has ever uttered. We can properly interpret Jesus' teaching in this way. Quote, Don't render to Caesar the things that don't belong to Caesar. Only the sovereign, the supreme power, has the authority to impose a tax, and he may do so only upon his own citizen and subjects. Is the state sovereign over Jesus Christ and his body, the church? No, the civil government has no such authority, lawful authority, biblically or constitutionally. If the civil government has the authority to tax the church, the church is a subordinate and a subject of the state. God ordained both the church and the civil government and has delineated their respective spheres of authority. There should be mutual accountability between the church and the state, but one is not an underling of the other. America's founding fathers forever abolished the old state church and church state systems. However, those who would now advocate that the church should be subordinate to the state are in reality calling for a return of that old state church system. For the church to apply to a government to be exempt from taxes presupposes that the government has legitimate authority to impose taxes on the church to begin with. Such thinking smacks of Erastianism. <clears throat> and again, like I said yesterday, this is, this is a symptom. This is one of the symptoms of all of these irresponsible Bible colleges teaching all of these uh, yet-to-be hireling contract pastors, allowing them to forget history. That is so irresponsible because the people who populated this land when our founding documents were drafted, would have never gone for those founding fathers, which many of them, yes, were colluding even then with Rome. They were. The people that populated this land would have never have allowed for any such laws to be put in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights to in any way join the church in the state nor give the state any power over the church because those people that populated this country back then 
They were either directly fleeing from the persecuting arm of Rome or its essentially its mirror in England, the Anglican Church. They were fleeing these things more from Rome than the Anglican Church, but they knew the evil dangers of the state having any authority over the church. That's why we can't forget our history. And we have, and we've gotten ourselves in this mess. And I absolutely blame all the institutions in this country that have been charged with teaching leaders of the church because you've let them forget history. Shame on you. Okay, it should wrong our consciences. The clergy in America have not always been so confused on the issue of state taxation of the church. For many years, it was understood that the church cannot and must not go to the state with hat in hand and ask permission to be exempted from taxes. To do so would be an admission that the church was under the state jurisdiction. Instead, the church must refuse such an admission. The Reverend Isaac Bacchus was one such clergyman. In September of 1775, he preached a sermon to the Massachusetts Assembly in which he stated, Yet, as we are persuaded that an entire freedom from being taxed by civil rulers to religious worship is not a mere favor from any man or men in the world, but a right and property granted us by God, who commands us to stand fast in it. We have not only the same reason to refuse an acknowledgement of such a taxing power here, as America has the above said power, but also According to our present light, we should wrong our consciences in allowing that power to men, which we believe belongs only to God. Yeah. <clears throat> our founding fathers, they knew where they came from. They knew the horrors of the church in Europe all those years under the brutal hand of the papacy they knew it and they would not give an inch they would not allow for their congregations and for this people of this land to suffer under that tyranny we shame their struggles today. Myth number four, 501c3 status legitimizes the church. It's a sad commentary on the church of our day when any church feels compelled to go to sinners to seek legitimacy. The church of Jesus Christ is in no way legitimized by the license, approval, acknowledgement, or permission of wicked men. Those who don't appreciate how corrupt the IRS is haven't taken the time to study the public record. For any church to submit to the IRS for 501c3 approval in an effort to be perceived by the world as being honest, providing for honest things, even if it is well-intentioned, is nonetheless completely illogical. Accountability is a good thing but only when we make ourselves accountable to those whom the scriptures call us to be accountable and to those who are honest and trustworthy themselves. Is it biblical for a church to make itself accountable to the IRS? Is the IRS honest and trustworthy? Is the IRS itself legitimate such that it can with any genuine sense of credibility legitimize anyone else as legitimate? Here's a dictionary definition. Legit I mate. Legitimate. An adjective. One 
being in compliance with the law, lawful, a legitimate business. And definition two, being in accordance with established or accepted patterns and standards. Let's examine the IRS's own track record to determine its legitimacy. The last time that the Government Accounting Office even attempted to audit the IRS's books was in 1996. They're supposed to audit the IRS every year, but they are no longer able to do so. In that year, GAO audits determined that over 13 billion of the taxes that the IRS had collected in 1995 could not be accounted for. 13 billion dollars had vanished and the IRS offered no better explanation than to shrug their shoulders. The GAO found the IRS books in such a shambles that they declared the IRS to be unauditable. Furthermore, the IRS refused to be held accountable for the loss. How could 501c3 recognition from such a corrupt entity, an agency that literally holds itself to be above the law and accountable to no one, result in quote-unquote legitimacy? It's simply illogical to hold that recognition from any agency that isn't legitimate itself could result in legitimacy. Is Honesty, morality, a prerequisite for 501c3 recognition. If it were, then only honest and moral groups would be approved. But that is simply not the case at all. Even just a cursory review of IRS Publication 78, which is an annual list of all 501c3 organizations, reveals that many thousands of 501c3s are immoral and wicked organizations. These include Satanists, Wiccans, Homosexuals, Pedophiles, Pornographers, Pro-Aborts, Pagans, Atheists, and thousands of other organizations which are hell-bent on destroying the moral fabric of this nation. Becoming a 501c3 places any church in very sordid company. It is both unbiblical and illogical to claim that a church becomes, quote, legitimate, unquote, by receiving a 501c3 status. <clears throat> and that's it for, for this video today. Um, the next video will start with 501c3 problems. I will again include a link uh, to Hush Money so that uh, all you guys out there can go through and read these things for yourselves. Um, and, oh gosh, I know that earlier in the broadcast, <laughs> as if this were a broadcast, but anyways, I um, I'd promised to, uh, I think I'd promised to put a link to something else in there and hopefully while this thing uh, loads up and transfers into video and all that stuff I will think of that so either which way uh, I hope to come back to you very soon with more chapters from a brief sketch of the Waldenses I'm so sorry that oftentimes I can get uh, I can get kind of going in a number of different directions and so many of them are so important um, they're important to me, and I know that a lot of them are really important to all of you, and I really appreciate all of you who listen to this because we need fellowship. It's the reason I do this. I don't do this to come out here and 
uh, act as an authority in any way. I do this because we need fellowship. If, if you're anything like me, you don't even have one flesh and blood person that you can sit down to over a meal or over coffee and talk to the things that you have been shown by the Spirit of God in the last, who knows, one month, six months, one year, six years. But you know what I'm getting at. We need fellowship. And I thank everybody for listening. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad for you that, that write to me and talk to me because I need that. I started doing this for that. I, I want to talk to people. I want to know my brothers and sisters that are out there who also, as me, don't really have anyone in their uh, immediate sphere or that they know of that they can just sit down and have fellowship with in light of so much that we have been shown. So until next time, three things that I know are the truth. One is Jesus is Lord. Two is God's kingdom is forever. And three is, I am your servant. Farewell.